Welcome to the studio. My name is Mark Chillingworth. Today we're discussing improving customer and team experience and I'm joined by a group of business technology leaders with a great deal of experience in that field. Thank you for joining the debate everyone. We're talking about improving customer and team experience. You all represent organisations that have uh, front offices, as it were, right across the nation, probably across uh, different geographies, uh, different nations and what have you. How uh, challenging is it to deliver, first of all, that experience to your end users to be as seamless and as brilliant as they're probably used to in their daily personal technological lives? I, I suppose the interesting thing is, is what, what experience are you trying to improve or what element of it? So if you, if you think about the problem you're trying to solve, then it might not be obvious that you're doing the right thing. I mean, obviously, you know, consumer products, and I've you know, previously worked on a lot of consumer products, and they have a certain uh, value that comes from being honed on large numbers of users and large amounts of data to try and understand what's working and what's not. So when you look at uh, your teams especially, and also the, the products they're using, as well as your customers, you need to, you need to be very clear on what, what problem are you trying to solve? So you're, you're actually, you actually have the information ready to be able to spend and invest in the right things because you might be, you might not be solving the right problem, or you might not have the right focus to actually really improve the, the holistic customer experience. And that, that, that's a really important thing, which I've, I've learned through hard, hard experience. <laughs> so you have to be really clear that you are solving the right problem, and have evidence and proof that it's getting better that you know that you you get value from doing that and also when to stop and move on to the next problem you have it's never it's never ever just one thing so i think that that's really the thing that i think it is is really most important before you start uh, trying to improve experience you really need to be sure you have some objective which is clear that's a good point. yeah uh, one of the things I think all the way back to when I was studying years and years ago, we were doing marketing and they teach you about segmentation. And what I noticed when I came into IT is that there's a little bit of segmentation, but there's not enough of it. So segmenting the users, we, you talk about kind of different users and, and different cases and different persona when you do a workplace, but actually you need that, you need a lot more segmentation. We, you, you, you asked about kind of the geographic dispersion and stuff like that. So we've got a lot of systems. Uh, they've grown up over many years. That they're, they're, they're not all one system. And people say, okay, I need, I need one system because I need to be able to answer the question for the customer and everything else. When you break it down, how many of our customers are actually purchasing from multiple locations at the same time through the same supply chain? And, th and therefore, all the effort that goes into building, you know, one system that'll do everything is enormous it probably won't work because it's, it's incredibly difficult. But actually, if we understood, well, that segment needs to have that amount of information and 98% of it comes from this system, actually, you could probably design a much better experience than, than try to do the whole thing. Um, and sometimes that's a challenge. You know, have you segmented what you want? Do you really understand it? And can you, how close can you get? Yeah, and it stretches quite far from a perspective of, you know, going to your point around putting all things in a single system in a single place. You know, the advent of cloud kind of means that you take an application, maybe Office 365 or something to that effect, because for business reasons, cost reasons, you know, application management reasons and so on, it makes a huge amount of sense. And then what gets forgotten is the fact that, you know, cloud is not on the doorstep of the user. It might be for some users, but, you know, for a, for a global organization, if your Office 365 tenant happens to be in Europe and you happen to be based in Europe, great. You happen to be based in the US or Asia or something like that that user experience is gonna be very, very inconsistent across the enterprise. And so you've made a great business decision from one perspective, you've saved cost, efficiency, and whatever else, and then you've created new problems that you weren't maybe thinking about. And then you sort of get back in that cycle of, you know, trying to fix a problem that didn't exist before you did something big over here and it gets stuck. And that's probably the biggest challenge I see with geography is delivering that consistency to all users all the time. I think as well with the whole international space, we've all got different cultures. You know, we all recognise that and we all want to support, support that. And delivering that customer experience that's seamlessly on behalf of one organisation, the one brand experience, can sometimes be hard. And actually sort of echoing a little bit of your point earlier, John, in terms of, you know, what is the purpose of the organisation? If you come back to the root core of why are you there um, and what's the purpose and therefore understand what the customer experience will be, hold those values, actually the technology will make it 
it, you know, work in that sense. Right. So I think from a, um, a customer experience perspective, geographic is first. I think we all go back to purpose um, and, and go from there. We've had a lot of hype in the last two to three years of it all being customer centric CIOs, uh, uh, customer centric IT teams. Has that uh, changed the challenge at all? What's maybe changed is the ability to see and understand the data in a, in a, in a much clearer way. So, uh, and the options you have um, to pursue uh, to pursue your objectives have changed quite a lot as well. So, do you, when you're looking at uh, global distribution, we have you know quite a large global network, and in previous roles, lots of uh, massive multinational, multi-language services, and you you, you think. Uh, you think you understand what the problem is, but it sort of comes back to your point. So, what's the experience like in this particular region, or how does it, and how much does it, does it matter that you fix it for, uh, for particular times of day or particular types of task which people are trying to, trying to perform? So, for example, I mean, uh, Google, for example, causes you, causes you a problem because people look at Google and go, why, why doesn't all search work that way? You know, well, why do I have to? Why does it have to be more complicated than this? And they're absolutely right. It shouldn't be. So, I, th I think you have to, um, uh, you have to reset the expectations of people just picking up on, you know, what what challenges and what expectations people have. They don't. Um, I guess that they don't have a different expectation of a of a, a B2B system as opposed to a B2C system. Right. It shouldn't be any difference. So I've not felt that particular change because <laughs> I think I've always been obsessed with this. Uh, but I think it's just how you, uh, how you progress that, uh, that view of how you build things to remove, I guess, remove those uh, friction points within the experience. So to play devil's advocate, we've not all become customer centric, we've actually just become data aware of, of the customer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and, and if from an IT perspective, have we got customers or have we got colleagues, stakeholders, users, right. what, whatever it's going to be. And, and um, I, I changed roles within an IT context and, and switched from business relationship towards uh, IT ops and you know, I thought, mm, yeah. We, we don't want customers, you know, ops will just manage this as and when you need to kind of thing. So, but you, you, you start to understand, you start to think about, well, what is their experience and, and, and what's, what's it going to work and, and how, mu how much can we afford? So it, we're in B, we're B2B, so what we'd be looking at is we've got a lot of legacy systems, we've got a lot of internal systems. Yes, we can improve those. Yes, we could change the customer, the, the user experience on those. But the amount of money we've got is constrained, therefore what will we invest in will be actual real customer facing. So the word customer that you use has, has forced a debate on, well, what do we really mean and where is our priority? So can we improve internal systems? Yes. Does it make a fundamental difference to the real customer experience? Probably not. Therefore, let's put our investment in that and try and understand how we can invest in the, the, the contact with the real customers, the paying customers. Yeah. 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 I mean, Joe, you mentioned cloud computing earlier, mm -hmm. um, and actually, you know, what that has done is, I think, really helped the startup world because you can just uh, go and create something. Let me, you know, I'm broad brushing here. That's not how it works, but you know, there's new innovations happening. You can create new applications. You can spin up stuff, spin down, and actually, what that has turned in terms of expectation for customers, um, I like to sort of more call it as convenience. Actually, as a customer, um, I want a convenient way to engage with you, to interact with you, to whether it's your service or product, I want to be able to do that. So I think the expectations of users from users, from customers, from right. us, has turned much more into I want quick now, I want answers, I want social media, I want this, I want da 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 da. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you if you sort of um, you know going back to that point um, of of the user's expectation when they're at home using whatever it may be apps and various technologies and and, and their experience. And you know, one of the things we see very regularly is if you look at the the agility that cloud gives those those not just cloud first but cloud native organizations that they haven't had to go through that journey that never ending journey of digital transformation um, a leagues ahead from a um, ability to adapt uh, ability to deliver consistency to all kinds of customers you know you mentioned Nick you know the different layers of customers you have internal customers you have external customers you have you know, B2B customers and so on, mm -hmm. all of those layers of customers want that perfect, consistent performance all the time. And 
it's sort of achievable, a little easier you could say when you're starting from a blank sheet of paper and you're building the things from zero. When you're going from a what we can call a legacy estate of technology, infrastructure, solutions, visibility, um, and so on, and trying to then adapt that to this cloud native, cloud first world, at least what we're seeing is this, this very big competitive advantage that these tiny startup cloud native customers have over the large enterprises, you know, still on that journey. Uh, and we see a massive gap between some of those enterprises on that journey. You know, the ones that kind of look holistically around, yes, we're doing that, but how does it affect all of these other layers versus the ones that do something, wait for the impact, then react, and, and you get into that cycle, and it's vastly different in, in, in the outcome of that. And Avril touched on it about, the other, the other thing Cloud's done, of course, is enabled line of business or anyone in your, in your team to purchase a whole range of mm -hmm. applications, which has changed the dynamic again, isn't it? And, and the number of discussions we've had today have, has been about you know, the, the change of control dynamic within IT. Uh, presumably that's changed, changed just the way your organizations, the way you lead now, because uh, collaboration's the obvious one to pick on, isn't it? People, some, some people want Slack, other people want uh, Teams, other people want Skype. You probably have to support all of them, do you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. officially or unofficially. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it is one of the problems you have to deal with because uh, you know, if you, if I want to call you, if I can uh, call you by four different methods which work different ways and some of them require a headset and some of them come through the computer and some of them require a phone and some of them require an actual, an actual phone, mm -hmm. which I haven't seen for, you, for a while now, <laughs> but you know, you, you, you you can really confuse people as to what's the what's the way, uh, the best way to communicate as as a group. And you know, the thing that changes definitely is how how do teams work more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, getting people off email into that sort of uh, Slack-like structure or Teams-like structure. Teams is in Teams, the product. Yeah. You no, know, you 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 see you see a marked change if you can get people to engage in that model and. Um, it is a much more effective way for, for a, a team, as in the people, <laughs> for them to actually work together, especially when you have uh, teams globally distributed across, uh, across many regions and possibly it's a good way to standardize your communication. Yeah. It is, we've started using Ring Center actually. Uh, right. And uh, it's great because um, the way Cancer Center is made up, we're you know, being built by the community, um, you know, and, and CSR and uh, donated hours. So we're, none of us work for the same organization. So I think collaboration across different types of organizations and having that facility to be able to just quickly IM or you around, can I video call you, has made such a big difference. Um, um, I've noticed, you know, just even in this part of the journey. But again, you know, going back to some more enterprise, you know, which one do you use? You know, how do you use it? And I'm, I'm seeing and I'm hearing a lot of we, we've implemented a certain product, um, but I don't know how to use it or how we, or how, or how we should, should go with it. So I think what's happening as well is we're making it available. Mm -hmm but we're not actually talking about best use or how to use it and therefore it's not being adopted by some right. areas because they're nervous and they're not sure. I, mean, I don't know if you're seeing that. Uh, definitely, I mean, there's a large global office product. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you know, often we, we do get the question, well, which bit should I use for which? And we say, well, it's up to you because actually the flexibility is there within the, within the tools that are available to do what you want to do. If you want to share in a small group, use this. If you want to work in a team, you can use this. If you, if you want to work fairly traditionally and you want a library of data, then you can, you can do this. The whole point is you, you can find it because you've got the search capability there. I, so, I mean, we've done all the obvious things. We've put in um, help desks, we've put in to tools, we've put in internet sites with training and all the rest of it. Some get it, some don't. And the question is, you mentioned about control earlier, do we want to control that? So do we want to control how many teams get set up? Because it might be a lot of admin or something like that. Well, probably not, because at the end of the day, you're just controlling it because you think you want to control it. You know, the, the, the power is for the, the greater value is in actually just getting the product used a lot. Yeah, because it's not cheap. And the, the control factor is obviously important just from you know, data security and, and, and related topics, but also, you guys have made an investment in a technology, the adoption's low or zero or, or wrong, and you know, people go off as individuals taking on you know, various products, applications and so on that you're not aware of. That then goes viral and everybody as teams, they say, I'm using this tool, let's use this tool, we can collaborate better. And all of a sudden you have you know, corporate data, intellectual property, 
conversations going through technologies that you haven't invested in, you don't control, you can't yeah, measure that, and so on. That, that will be one aspect of control that we, we have been able to do. So uh, if we're introducing new capabilities, so you know, we, we're quite aggressive on Dropbox, for example, mm -hmm. even, even at senior levels in the organization. If we see it, we, we, we kind of, right. we call them in for some personal coaching, you know, because that's, it's, that's not where we want to be. And we have adequate products that do the same thing now. now over the years, that hasn't necessarily been the case. You know, other products have been really good and we don't have anything as good. But once you get to a certain level, you can then start to exercise control on things you particularly don't want. Right. So, so that's, that's, I'm more, less worried about the control of the environment of, of the office product, but I am saying, okay, that is the area, that's definitely not. Right. So you can start to draw some boundaries. And at least there. knowing they exist. You know, one of, the, one of the things we see very regularly when we're talking to our customers with, with various visibility and monitoring tools is, we get asked to put our solutions in place to help them get analytics and so on and data about their, their applications and performance and so on. But the biggest thing that almost always happens is when they see the list of applications that users are using either on their official enterprise estate or off. Uh, and that's the biggest shock. And I think that's where the biggest value comes with the, you know, the point around data visibility and monitoring. Firstly, knowing what's there. And then you can make reasonable decisions around, you know, that's official, that's unofficial, this is a gray area which will allow, and maybe you don't have to support, and, and, and so on. So it sounds like cloud computing has raised expectations, but actually the ex excessive amount of choice has actually caused some confusion all the way through the organization. Would that be a fair analysis? I would absolutely agree with that. And, and I think, you know, uh, you know, in our roles, it's almost like we're expected to understand every single tool that comes out and changes and do and all the new features and what's appropriate for which particular thing. And, you know, actually, you know, trying to keep up ourselves to be able to advise uh, and, and everything else, um, you know, it, it's quite a challenge in itself, let alone if that's not your role. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, by the way, we're asking you to keep up with all this stuff um, and work in a different way, which you probably haven't done before. Some people, as you said, will absolutely jump at it and other people just um, not at all. So it has been quite complex, uh, but exciting at the same time. The one thing you, you were talking earlier uh, about um, the cloud computing so startups and you can do this and you have flexibility. What we found in a corporate environment uh, with the Azure platform is you can spin up databases, you can add the capabilities, you get the platform services, and you can try out things, and particularly for data analytics and, and those sorts of things. And that works well. And you saw some of that in Paul Tolbert, I think, before as well in terms of IoT impact and those sorts of things. The kind of downside of that is that you. Um, you get an enterprise culture around it, which is, okay, I've done that, I've got that, well, I'll just leave it there because the cost structure that I had before was in a data center on premise. Mm -hmm. And once we'd invested in it, if the space was there, well, then the space yeah, was there. Yeah. In a cloud context, the, the charging models are different. So you have to exercise then different control points, if you like, from an oversight. So you talk about uh, monitoring. That's where the monitoring piece comes in interest to us because have the behaviors of the people who done that and used and done some citizen development, has that been for the good or for the bad in the long run? So, so, there's, so there's some new things that we're having to look at there. How important is the performance of your applications in terms of business success? Can, you know, we, we only ever hear the negative stories. Right. Um, do you all face, do you all wake up and live with, you know, I could be the BA today? Um, We'll start with the negative and, and move towards. <laughs> uh, and are, are you all working like on the things where? Like to the positive, <laughs> <laughs> to, to the positive. <laughs> in my case, our business is is built on the fact that that is the case. You know, we, we we have or you all have. You know, users that there are some corporate applications they have to use. You know, this is not a choice. Part of their work is those applications. So you know, for us, our business has effectively been built on performance management of those mission critical business applications. Um, what we do see is the element of it's well understood that these issues are there and they need to be addressed. And then there's the element of users are so sick and tired of the performance issue, they stop complaining. And I guess from your perspective, making big decisions around strategies, where to invest and so on, you might sometimes have a bit of a false information of, no, that, one, that thing works fine. Nobody ever complains about it. And it might be because it's great or it might be because they've completely given up. Um, and that gets you stuck in the middle, I guess, around what you do next in, in such a situation. In lots of businesses I've worked in in the past, it's vitally important, but um, uh, where, I, where I am now, I think you, you see an obsession with efficiency and time and being able to uh, effectively 
get to the services you need for them to work in your region or your location and to work across locations in some quite complex ways. It, it's If that isn't working well or isn't working quickly or isn't reliable, then that's a major issue. Um, so we bill on six minute intervals. So if someone's sitting around for a minute, right. the, the clock is already ticking. So it, you need to be very aware of how how fast the services work and how efficiently they work. Um, and so, yeah, it, it wouldn't be too much to say it's a bit of an obsession now. So we're, we're starting to look at, so I've only been in this role for 10 months or so, but looking at, you know, at what sort of tooling do we need to really understand what's happening and you know, getting into more and more detail around what's happening, not just on the desktop, but all the way back from wherever you're using the application back to wherever it's getting its data from and what that route is and how that is being delayed or how things could be uh, changed to be more efficient. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it's a bit of an obsession at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think that in, in we've seen, with, for CIOs, we've seen the digital revolution and the, the growth of the CDO and the, the, the rise of applications, if you like, over infrastructure and infrastructure as a service, and that's all fine. But, you know, you, you, you mentioned BA and stuff like that. The, if, if we are now so tech dependent, then the operational role for technology is, is actually much higher, not much lower. It's maybe not grabbing the headlines, and, unless it's a bad incident, but the, the integrity of your, the systems, the capabilities of the network, the, the fundamental size of the, of the estate that you've got, the, the ability to schedule, to manage, to plan, to plan well in advance. You know, we see in our operations area, the, the biggest skill that we're looking at in terms of the teams we've got is not so much technical, it's, it's more logistical. You know, what are you going to schedule? When are you going to schedule it? How many jobs are running? Why are they running? Mm -hmm. and, in, and increasingly, the next step in that is, well, not just monitoring tools, but have we got automation tools and have we got predictive tools that are going to help us understand what we're going to do? Um, work we do with some, some of our partners on security, probably the same as you guys, you know, it's, it's looking at billions of log items uh, in the course of a month to identify two use case mm -hmm. items that might be a security risk. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah? You can't do that all I the time. So it, you've it's got interesting in the, the things which I look for in some of the roles now. Um, maybe this is, maybe again, always been the case, but I think it, it's something which you, when you look at all the choices you have about how you approach a particular problem, it's very easy to build layer on top of layer on top of layer of complexity um, what you're trying to do is find people who can pick through that and understand how do you what's the right choice to make this simpler because mm -hmm. simpler is easier to run easier mm -hmm. to manage it's faster mm -hmm. it's more efficient it's more secure and, and those things are you know key metrics which actually you would judge judge yourself by so um, that in itself is is something which maybe isn't quite as obvious from the initial question but actually uh, making some of those choices is the right thing to do so it's more fundamental than just if we could just make this application a bit faster well right yeah actually maybe do you need that application you know do you need yeah. it at all yeah. so yeah. is there another way of doing it which is better so you you have to think about your uh, the people you work with and the partners and make sure they also are on the same journey as you are they're providing the right options which also sounds like business and technology performance is very much bound into business processes and actually you need to yeah. be looking at simplifying your business processes and then your, your application performance, your business performance will yeah. follow. I mean, uh, sometimes, I mean, it, it's not always the case, I guess. I, I, if it was that simple, it would be yeah. it would be easy, you know. But um, it, so you have to be a little wary of what assumptions you make. But um, uh, there is an element of that. So are there things you can do in a, in a more efficient way? And I think that that's an ongoing, an ongoing task. You 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 never stop doing that. You're always looking for ways which which will allow you to monitor and see what's happening. I, I quite like what you say because it chimes back to what we were talking about earlier about the sort of segmentation. But is there a danger then that you kind of that there's a desire always to rationalise the number of applications you've got? Mm. But in the way that you describe, what you might end up with is, is a larger number of smaller applications. Um, but no, <laughs> I, 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 I think actually, well, but possibly, but I think you know, what I suppose the worst thing is you end up with a bit of both. So you end up yeah. with uh, yeah. more big applications and more small applications all trying to talk to each other, which, is, which can be a bit of a mess. And it's not entirely obvious to each of the individual owners of those things that 
why it's so complicated. Particularly for so citizen development. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you know, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, something again, uh, it's not to be scared of. So sometimes that is the right choice. Yeah. But I think it's making sure you put the right things in place so that that can be done in a way which is which delivers the promise of that. Um, because if you, if you don't have the right infrastructure to run that type of Know, low code environments or citizen development which which is a great thing if people can do it you know th these are things which you would want to make sure do work within within the estate what you don't want to find is you the limitations of other things you've done I mean that those things also don't work yeah. or they don't work yeah. as they yeah. promised so um, yeah you shouldn't be scared of them you should just th figure out what's the right way to use them if I may put a bit of a startup mm. spin on this um, you know, so actually, you know, it's not about the number of applications at this point. Um, it is about, as you say, the performance. And I think what's um, exactly the same is prioritization. Yeah, exactly the same as, you know, what do you prioritize? What's most important to keep, you know, the, the business engagement and the right. s success? Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of things is actually, you know, what, what we're doing is um, about sort of pulling data together. So actually what needs to be real time? You know, so for example, you know, someone asks Av a cancer question, we want that real-time data the pulled back from the N NHS site. But actually, if someone's trying to find a Facebook group, how often do those get updated? Is a once a day refresh mm -hmm. okay? And I think it's, it's as well as how you use and pull the data that affects your performance and the speed in which results come back if you're an online uh, sort of space. So I think you know what I would uh, advise and sort of recommend to other sort of startups is if you're thinking about performance, what really does have to be real time to get the latest and greatest yeah. and best information yeah. versus realistically, if it's a 24 hour old pool, is it going to make a dramatic bit right. of difference? Because that will help your performance and the speed that's coming back. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Def definitely. We hear a lot about how all sectors are, are, are becoming much more digitally connected, uh, B2B in particular is going in, in, in the digital markets and what have you. Are, are you finding therefore you're also having to, to, to look at that? You, you are having to be customer driven no matter your sector to provide those services? You don't get to do it differently because you, uh, you judge yourselves by different standards. I, I think it's just as important to do that whatever sector you're in. So there's no reason for it to not be as good. I think, I mean, you mentioned that there might be limitations on you, but um, uh, fundamentally putting services together in the right way is, is, is the, the goal of this. You need to think about um, uh, not having a different way you, you measure against those metrics. Yeah. Mm. And omnichannel is important here. You know, mm -hmm. actually, you know, what is the channel of engagement? And then mm -hmm. you can start seeing, is there a trend in terms of what you were seeing as a request, a response, an interaction in one side compared to another channel? And there, you know, going back to earlier, we talked about data uh, and how much that is um, and should have been from the past, but we, we're getting, you know, more tools and kind of cloud computing and obviously mm -hmm. being able to crunch the data. We were able to see this a lot more and we'll be able to understand mm -hmm. customer behavior. So omni-channel and giving that, um, giving that a go is really important. I mean, there's a particular example from a company I used to work with. I mean, a few examples actually, which is, you know, consumer media brands and um, basically proving that uh, making things faster equaled money so you could show that when services were slow they cost you money when they're faster they made you money and that was a very powerful thing to understand so when you understand that then it's much easier to have a conversation around why would you change that metric so you yeah. so I, th I think it's I guess going back to what I said earlier it's having having the value of, of data understanding how that can make sure you do protect the customer experience because when you when you have that that safeguard, I guess, right. or maybe even you have someone who's you know, a champion of that, then it's it's not so easy to to affect that customer experience in a negative way because there's someone there who says, well, why are we doing this? This doesn't work as well. Um, so when you pull apart a, a particular um, a particular service is made up of lots of parts, and actually they all seem to be good, but when you pull them apart and put them all on the same machine. Uh, right. They don't work as well, and because they interfere with each other, and uh, you need to be on top of those sort of uh, those sort of outcomes. 
Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think, you know, we were talking earlier around, you know, the prioritization of certain services and applications and users and user groups and segmentation and so on. And, you know, there's also, also this huge disparity between the quality of services and solutions and products and applications and so on that might be, you know, we're talking about, you know, cultural differences and, and the thought process around someone thinking, I'm just this, you know, unimportant user in a random office on the other side of the world. So I've got the lowest layer of, you know, technology, even though what I'm doing is quite important versus maybe the opposite side where an actual consumer using a customer you know, facing um, solution gets the best of everything, the best monitoring, the best tools. Um, you know, John, you're making a point about you know, understanding data and the results of that data. You know, giving the best performance to a user is one thing, but then also having a consumer seeing things in the right way and especially some of the tricks that retailers do, making sure that you know, they can convert a cart into a sale and so on. All of those things come together, but I guess what I see is a lot of um, inconsistency around the processes, the rules, the, the priorities and, and the investment and even the data that gets collected across all of those different layers. So you get this different cultural difference from a technology standpoint on internal user, external consumer, maybe some business to business in the middle which is relevant. Uh, and that's probably what the, some of the impact of this, this era of cloud is having in that everybody's stuck in, well not everybody, cloud native are not stuck in hybrid but the traditional enterprise is. And I think, you know, John, you're making a point about what's on, what's off, what should be switched on, what do we keep, and so on. It starts getting bigger and bigger and almost impossible to manage. And at what point do you just think, you know what, let's switch that off and see what happens? Yeah, I, 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 okay. I, I kind of object to, you know, if you're stuck in hybrid, because that suggests that that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there, there is a, there, there, I don't see a world where entire cloud is a good I thing. Completely okay. agree. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, well, so probably the, uh, the terminology of hybrid. I think it was a John's point earlier. Yeah. You know, if you don't know why you're there and you don't know how right. you're going to get from there, or if indeed you want to get from there, then that's a pretty dark place. Right. Right. Okay. But if you are comfortable to be in hybrid for specific and you've made active choices, right. then that then might design, well be the right yeah. place. So sure. by design, because you may be on a kind of decline path or a growth path, wherever you're going to be. Cloud is interesting to us for SaaS services, for mm -hmm. functional activities, whether it's Workday, PeopleLink, these, thing, these kinds of things. But um, a fundamental operations, you know, the size of them, the nature of them, the legacy of them, we, we probably have them on site. On the other hand, because my mainframe operation, which has been completely stable for 40 or 50 years, actually sits in Belgium and has right. done for about 15 years, was I on the cloud before cloud was invented? Right. So it, it depends on the definition, yeah. it depends what you're gonna do, but I, I think your point earlier has made me think again about some of the choices that we're making. And, and the more active choices you can make, well then you can, you can explain it to people and you can deal with it. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Stuck. You can't use that word <laughs> stuck anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, could be, you could be stuck by design yeah, or yeah. stuck not by design. Yeah. I guess that's the, uh, that's the difference. Yeah, I mean, you have to be comfortable with change and how you make the right arguments about where you invest and what things. So, so you've, got a, you've got a mainframe in Belgium. Maybe there's no reason to change that ever. You know, that, that, that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be changed for change's sake, but you should be comfortable with knowing what the implications of that, uh, of that decision are, mm -hmm. and how you, know, you, you can reach the right outcomes for the rest of the, the pieces that need to sit around that. So what else do you need to do to make sure that that's effective and continues to be effective going forward? Um, I mean, uh, skills are also an interesting element of this. So finding people that not just, um, not just understand this well, but are actually passionate about it. So people who really care about shaving the milliseconds off things, right. you know, which actually uh, can make a huge difference because when you have someone who has that, uh, that potential to really have the energy to dive into some often quite complex interactions going on across, uh, certainly for a global business, you, know, you, mm. might, you might find that quite difficult to understand and where do you start with that problem? Where is the actual issue? And you, you find that some people have the propensity to do that and they, those are you know, it's another type of skill set which is growing and that the ability to understand you know, what things you can do about those problems is, is, is enormously valuable. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's similar to what we mentioned earlier with the, the technology piece. So you need a technology affinity and maybe a technology understanding, but you, you, you do need other skills, and whether it's kind of logistics mindset or data mindset, et cetera, to, to come at it from a, yeah. diff from a different perspective to say, what am I optimizing? Mm -hmm. You talk about speed, you, it, I guess banks and trading companies, those nanoseconds are crucial in a trading mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Yeah? 
for us, if we're sending an EDI invoice to a customer, you know, it doesn't need to be a nanosecond faster. Right. Mm. It really doesn't. Cares, it's yeah. just it's a one-time transaction once a day. We've touched on it briefly about the, the complexity, the number of applications, legacy, retiring uh, systems, what have you. How important uh, and how are you monitoring your estates uh, and to get, to get that understanding? You clearly, you're understanding your applications. How do you do it and how are you, how are you helping communicate that to the business? So you want to find a way in which you, let's say there's three parts to it. So you, you need to find a way in which you can bring together the data so you can start to link up what's going on. Because otherwise you'll be sent off on on uh, false, false truths. It's very easy to find things that are actually the real problem. So you need a way to bring the data together so you can start to see what's going on and uh, follow the trail to find the right point at which you can start to make a difference. And then you need some way to visualize that, which makes sense as well. So this is, uh, as I said earlier, some people will happily live in that sort of world. They will happily just poke everything and find out where, where is it slow, where, what's the problem. And I think you then need some way to, you know, to alert on these things because it, it's not just a, a one-off task. Because sometimes you know, it's, it's the problem of phoning your broadband provider and saying, well, the, the internet wasn't working last night. And they go, well, it is now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. So that, that hasn't helped me very much at all. And, and you need a way to find the right, uh, I guess sometimes it's tooling, sometimes it's just process, but finding the right way to look at the problem when it's actually happening. Because some of these, mm -hmm. sometimes it's not, a, it's not a constant problem. You know, some of these things can be very difficult to get to the root cause of yeah. certain events happen, they only happen at certain times, and then things become slow. And then uh, in the middle of the day, it all looks fine. So you need to find the right way to really understand the skill sets around, you know, um, uh, around testing and you know, th th there's there's all levels of testing uh, you need to think about around the way you load test and smoke test and find just find the the resilience level you're happy with within your system so it can cope with these different issues and you feel confident that you can then. Uh, you can leave it alone. You can go to bed at night, and you know right. you're not going to get a phone call at yeah, three a.m. Exactly. because it's it's falling over. You know that those things, those things can literally keep you awake at night. So it, you, you have to find ways to manage those problems. Yeah, and there's the there's the side of you know the reactive side and the proactive side. You know the the reactive side is you know something breaks, um, and again with with more services moving to cloud and less of that visibility and monitoring, you've got more black spots and and trying to even you know, the mean time between understanding what the actual problem is, because you usually see the symptom, right? So understanding what the real problem is and somehow using a tool set that's relevant to you know, take you right down to the actual cause of that problem. And the time from the start to the end is, is, is business, it's dollars, it mm -hmm. uh, impacts directly. And then the, the real question then becomes, why did it happen? How do we avoid it in future? And you know, to your point, John, if the broadband provider says, hey, it's all fine now, that does not answer your question. We sort of always look at, how do we help from a perspective of the reactive mean time to resolution? And then there's the proactive side of how do you use all of that huge amount of data you've got from many, many, many tool sets. You know, we see customers have so many point solutions that don't talk to each other or interact and then you're getting many different views of what the problem is. So the idea of taking real data, analyzing it in the correct way and using it to make real decisions, how to avoid problems in future, what systems do we change, what do we avoid, how do we do anything, and then relate that into a workbook of how you fix actual problems. And it's very rare that we see customers with a you know, maturity model with all of that where it just cycles and works. And the reason for that is, you know, talking about the stuck in hybrid mm -hmm. is we're never really stuck in hybrid because everything's always changing in some way, shape or form. So by the time you've got that real view of what's really going on now and you've solved that problem, everything's changed anyway. Yeah, something else has come up. Right. Yeah, something else has come up. Yeah. So, uh, this is kind of traditional monitoring. Have we got monitoring of infrastructure? Yes. Do, you know, do we respond to that? Have we automated this? Yes, you do those. I think the interesting piece is the, the challenge for us over the last couple of years has been in the kind of application space and application monitoring. Do you know, what have we got? How do we do it? Where are we going with our traditional CMDB, which is still probably mm -hmm. a good thing as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right, okay. but, uh, <laughs> 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 and and say, so, okay, well we can actually, yeah, with some of the platforms that we're now using to support our service capability, you can put the uh, CMDB in, but then you can enrich those components and you can add to those and you can start to use it and say, okay, where might, where, which have generated higher problems? What's my likelihood? What's the predictability of getting to that point? 
and you can guide the, the teams can use that data to guide where they might start to look for yeah. things they want to do. We've been trying to understand more than our applications, which applications generate uh, more problems um, and have more but have more users or fewer users. And we're trying to kind of plot, mm -hmm. you know, have we got actually a bunch of applications which have got reasonably low numbers of users who are actually high callers to our desk? Right. And, and, and you know, and how many transactions do those applications process? So where are they? Very few people call me and say, you know what, that MM thing in SAP, oh, you know, it's terrible. And uh, you know, we you, you get zero calls, and we've got thousands of users. Mm. To come full circle, which yeah. is very much John's first point, wasn't mm. it about under <coughs> looking at the business and, and finding out what 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 is the pain point of the yeah, business, right. and then looking at that as a as a customer experience and, and driving a change as a result. I guess you're looking for the pain, you know, the things that have the biggest impact on people every day, and, and that creates a real, uh, that just create real opportunities, I suppose. The, the challenge, I think, so one of the things we're trying to leverage is, you know, some of the platforms that we've put in place to, to do monitoring, etc. Is how do we, we've now got 12, 18 months of data, so how can we start right. using that proactively to sort of to start looking for these things? But the skills and the knowledge you need is is a mix. You, you need people who've got that propensity to, to go and have a little look and, and push mm -hmm. a few things and prod a few things. But you need some people with some experience of the landscape and everything else. And ideally, people who've got some business experience as well, who've mm -hmm. got that experience of actually using things and trying to get processes done and say, well, yeah, but it's only at the month end. I mean, it, you need to have the right ways for this to lead through to whatever business case you might be making as well. So, yeah. you know, there are there are decisions to be made based on what you find. So if you performance test something and it's it's not fast enough, well, what other things are you gonna do about it? And yeah. how are you gonna make the case to, to clearly explain to the rest of your business around why they need to do it, or why right. does it really matter? So you know, having a, a well-formed conversation around that at, at whatever level you have to within your organization to make that, to make that seen as an important issue is is absolutely crucial because you can forget these things and and you find uh, people will be unhappy but their voice doesn't seem to be getting through to the right to the right level in the organization to make a change that's something which you have to think about definitely it's such a vast question and i just want to reflect on something that joe and nick said a bit earlier on um you know going back to that sort of cloud computing and monitoring what our usage is you know obviously you've got the traditional sort of spin ups and down everything else but i think um for every organization and um you know, perhaps even more so from a not-for-profit perspective um just the simple processes now really really need to be tight your starters and leavers you've got a license fee Right. You know, mm. per person. Now, if it takes a month for that information to trickle down to the person that's taking off that person's license, you're paying right. for yes. that time. Yeah. So I think, you know, when we talk about monitoring, I think it's now down to the minutiae and making sure that processes are tight across the board. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And we, we've been on a journey with uh, another one of our partners looking at kind of using automation tooling and stuff like that. and. You ultimately come to the position you can't have something that drops from mailbox to mailbox to mailbox. It's yeah. got to be connected with a with an automation tool or, mm -hmm. or a platform that's going to execute that task. We we talked to one of the other teams about um, you know the impact of automation. We could get a request for software and broadly we were getting 80% in five days or whatever the KPI was kind of thing. But the the distribution curve was very flat. Kind of thing, yeah. So to the extent that the two ends were, some were getting it phenomenally quick, some, you know, and it was unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Now with automation, it's ninety-eight percent within inside eight minutes. Mm -hmm. One thing which I guess we haven't talked about, which is you know mobility and how, how the change in the working environment is yeah. is forcing people to work in different places and giving them the opportunity to work in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also another factor in. You know, people working on trains to mm -hmm. planes to uh, different environments that they might find themselves in and their expectation will be that they can they can work when they want to work yeah. mm -hmm. and then they can pretend the internet isn't working when they don't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it is it, it's it's a very important change in the way people yeah. people's expectations are a cultural change in the organizations yeah yeah thank you all for yeah. 
thank you all for sharing your, your fantastic insights and, and, and how you are, are driving the change in the customer and team experience in your organizations. It's been a really interesting debate. Mm -hmm.